Good evening. My name is Bob Liff, and this is the CUNY Forum, a monthly town meeting that brings prominent New Yorkers together with faculty and students of the Edward T. Rogowski Internship Program in Government and Public Affairs. The national debate on, on undocumented immigration going on now in the Republican presidential nominating process is very different from the voices heard in this city, where immigrants and their children comprise a larger percentage of residents than when my grandparents arrived from Eastern Europe in the first decades of the last century. The candidates are engaging in a contest to see who can be tougher on the undocumented, even as businesses that rely on those immigrants to take low-wage jobs warn their economic livelihood and that of their home communities is at risk. In this city, we have, we have long had a high level of tolerance for the undocumented, even in the face of federal law. The best-known example was the executive order issued by Ed Koch that barred city agencies from questioning the immigration status of those seeking help from hospitals or the police or sending their kids to school. But starting with laws passed under President Clinton expressly overruling the city's order, a law we continue to, to, to ignore, to laws and policies under President Obama, the noose is tightening on undocumented immigrants. One example involves a program called, called uh, Secure Communities, which requires anyone arrested to have their immigration status checked, even if they have not been charged, let alone convicted, of any offense. The program is one reason, maybe not the dominant reason, but one reason, that there have been record numbers of, of, of deportations under President Obama, even as Republicans accuse him of being soft on immigration to pander for Hispanic votes. Governor Cuomo has already indicated the state will not comply with, with uh, secure communities, and one of our panelists has introduced a bill in the city council to bar the city from transferring those, un those undocumented who are arrested but have no criminal records to a federal custody and eventual deportation, at least until they have been formally charged and convicted. The law is the law. Asking, asking law enforcement agencies to uh, disregard the law is a slippery slope. But this is a city where the person sitting next to you on the subway could be uh, subject to deportation uh, merely because of their immigration status. When the law conflicts with common sense and what the city sees as an issue of, of human rights, what are we to do? We're joined by four New Yorkers who take part in that public debate about immigration and the Secure Communities Program. City Councilwoman Melissa Mark Viverito uh, represents Manhattan's 8th District, centered in East Harlem and including Manhattan Valley and part of Mott Haven in the Bronx. Heather McDonald is a fellow at the Manhattan Institute and, and contributing editor to City Journal. Peter Markowitz is associate clinical professor of law at Cardozo Law School and the director of the Catherine O. Greenberg Immigration Justice Clinic. And Robert Smith is an associate professor of sociology, immigration studies, and public affairs at Baruch College. He's also a co-founder of MexEd, the Mexican Education Foundation of New York. Uh, Melissa, let me start with you. You have introduced the bill. Why do you see the need for the bill? Why? Well, we're very proud of this bill. It's a bill that has been introduced. We've already had a set of hearings, and we're looking to pass it before the end of the year. And it really was a result of the local activism and community advocates and the Cardozo Law School as well that brought to our attention the relationship that was existing in the city for decades between the Department of Homeland Security uh, and, and our correctional facilities here in New York City. Um, if people don't know, there has been, under the DHS, under the Department of Homeland Security, there are several programs. Secure Communities is one program. Then there's another program called the Criminal Alien Program. That program has been going on in the city of New York for decades. And basically, what we have is federal immigration agents that are based in Rikers Island that have access to all the information of anyone that's brought to Rikers Island. And what we've been seeing historically is that close to 4,000 people a year, uh, the deportation process starts on people that um, have been held in Rikers Island. Now, when people come to Rikers, they're accused of a crime. They're not actually convicted of a crime. So what you've been having is people with extremely low-level offenses, uh, jumping a turnstile or something else, whatever it may be, very low-level offenses, not the hardened criminals that these policies uh, seek to, to really go after, um, that were being ensnared in, in, this, in, a, in a, this broken immigration system and deportation proceedings were starting on them. So what this does basically is legislate that we as a city are telling the Department of Corrections as a city agency that you are not to honor a detainer on someone who has committed a low-level offense, and the law specifically delineates what those low-level offenses are. <clears throat> um, and, but if you have a, a prior, you know, criminal history, if you have committed a serious crime in the past, then this would not apply to you, and ICE could go ahead and 
um, and basically drop the detainer and, and start the deportation proceedings on those people. So it's historic legislation, and we're able to do this because we are dictating, in fact, what, how we are going to use and utilize our city resources. And it really speaks to the high regard that we have and understanding that immigrants in this city are providing positive contributions to our local economies and to our city as a whole. Um, Robert, the, Melissa represents probably, um, I think, the largest Mexican community in the, in the city. We were discussing, I'm not sure if, 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 it's, if, if it's the largest, and you do a lot of work with um, Mexican immigrants. And, uh, you know, if you look at, you know, uh, Mexicans are a very good example of how this kind of this, this organic quality of, of immigration, such a high percentage of them come from one area in Mexico. They, they come from an area, in, uh, I guess, the area around Puebla. Does this information, does what's happening with, uh, with secure communities, other kinds of crackdowns, filter back, stop people from coming? Um, I, don't, I don't think that, that a thing like that would stop people from coming. Because um, it's in terms of the whole immigration, as a deterrent to immigration, I don't see it being very much of a deterrent because it's a very small... Um, it's a very small number of people. I do see it, however, as being a deterrent to people trusting the police. Um, and I think that's a problem. I'll, I'll give you two cases, one of which I, I know of personally and another one which I read about. A woman gets beaten by her husband repeatedly over a number of years, calls the police, and ends up getting deported, right? Because her husband says that she hit him. The charges against her are false. They're dropped. But she still gets into the ICE system, so the, the, the immigration deportation system, and she gets deported. How can you have a system where a woman is afraid to call the police because she might get deported? That, what the problem with secure communities is that the police are there to protect all the citizens and all the people, and the U.S. Constitution provides for equal protection of the laws to all the people, not some of the people. Um, and I'm not talking about citizens, but people. So that's one case. Um, and I think that, that makes the point very clearly. Um, another case I know of, of a guy who got arrested for drinking a beer in front of his apartment building. Um, he got deported for drinking a beer because he ended up getting a desk appearance ticket. He didn't know what it meant. He didn't show up. A warrant was sworn out because he had not appeared in court, and he ended up getting deported. And this was a kid that had lived here since he was like two years old. So how does a country end up raising somebody from the age of two to their mid-20s and then saying, well, you know what, you were drinking a beer in front of your apartment. Um, we're going to deport you. Um, I'll raise the one other question here. With children who come here at a young age and then are raised here in the United States as undocumented children, um, what kind of a system is it that we hold those children responsible for uh, their parents' administrative violation? Their parents committed a crime, an administrative, not a felony, not a violent thing. Um, the kids were brought in. The kids are then excluded from, you know, the formal labor market for the rest of their lives. It's like sentencing someone to a life at hard labor because their parents made a mistake. Um, Heather, the law is the law. And, um, but obviously the federal immigration law is broken. Uh, you know, you, there's, you know, uh, uh, if you, if you, it's not a state's responsibility to keep people from coming in. It's the federal government's responsibility. Why should the city cooperate with ICE and with the secure communities and with the idea of using city and state resources to kind of do the job of an immigration agency? Well, uh, the law, I find it troubling that the law states explicitly that if the immigration service puts a request <coughs> uh, to the You're talking about the city, officials, the, yes, the, the city the law, city proposal. Uh, that the city is actually going to ignore uh, a request of the federal government. That, that to me, is a, a very bizarre um, failure to live up to what should be a legal obligation. There is nothing illegal about what ICE is asking for. Somebody who comes into the country illegally, leaving aside Professor Smith's example of sort of Dream Act ch children issues, which is a very, very small percentage of, I think, what Melissa's bill is getting at, is doing so knowing what the legal consequences are. And until we change the law, the immigration law, deportation is the known and, and perfectly legal uh, 
punishment for coming into the country illegally. So I don't understand why it's a miscarriage of justice that somebody who has not only broken the immigration laws, but is also, as Melissa says, a low-level offender, uh, why that person has a claim to evade the known and explicit consequences of his immigration violation. These are, and low-level offenses uh, are often real burdens on a community. This is graffiti, drug possession, uh, thefts from, from uh, uh, bodegas, shoplifting. Uh, it, you have to work very hard to get a misdemeanor conviction brought against you. There's a lot of people who cycle through the system as these low-level <coughs> offenders that would now receive a grant of absolute immunity uh, from the city. And I've never spoken with a, a legal immigrant outside of people of, of Mexican extraction who do not feel that it is perfectly just to enforce the immigration laws. They did it legally uh, and, and they feel that it is as much of a, a violation of justice to say that people who are ignoring our system for legal entry should be given a free pass equal to those who, who obeyed Peter, the law when they came in. Uh, this kind of um, official resistance to, to secure communities, for want of a better term, uh, it's policy in the, in the state of New York because of Governor Cuomo in Illinois, in I think Massachusetts now. Um, how does ICE react to this kind of, the kind of organized resistance? Sure. Let me just first clarify just a misstatement. The law actually doesn't cover people who've been convicted of things like shoplifting. The law doesn't cover anybody and doesn't benefit anybody who's been convicted of any crime at all. Yes, it does. No, if you have an um, ACD, you're exempt. A, an ACD is a dismissal. It stands right. for a German contemplation of dismissal. Right. So that means that you're not convicted. And you don't have a record. Right. That's right. Most so nobody who's who been convicted of any misdemeanor charge at all can benefit from this law. The only people who benefit from this law are people who don't have criminal records and don't have pending criminal charges. Those are the only people <clears throat> who benefit from the law. So let's just make sure the facts are straight. But you asked a question about how ICE will react to various states' um, resistance to secure communities. It, ICE has really um, spoken out of both sides of its mouth with regard to the Secure Communities Program from step one. It started out um, in 2008 by telling states and localities this is a voluntary program. We understand there's an impact on local policy and you guys need to make decisions for yourselves about whether you want to participate. But as soon as some localities started saying, we decide not to participate, ICE changed its tune and said, oh, when we said voluntary, we meant only for the states. And only the states get to decide. And if the states opt in, we're not going to listen to local counties that want to opt out. And that was their policy until the states started speaking up and until Massachusetts and New York and Illinois said, we want no part. And then again, they shifted their position and came clean on their policy, which really was their internal policy all along, has been revealed through a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit that I've been litigating, um, which is that they intended all along to force this program down the throats of every state and locality in the country, notwithstanding the significant impact it has on local policing and on local immigrant communities. Can I just respond? Please. Uh, as Melissa herself acknowledged, <coughs> this does cover what she termed low-level offenders. The vast majority of, She's people, of people convicted who are of violations, coming in, not crimes. Who are coming in with uh, what could be a misdemeanor offense, you're going to get an ACD, unless you're there for maybe your fifth or your sixth time. The reality is, in this city, and you know it as well as I do, that if you're coming in with smoking a joint or graffiti, you're not going to be convicted of a misdemeanor. The, the burden on the system is too great you're going to have an ACD. That doesn't mean that you have not committed that offense. So there is a distinction there. But I would also just like to ask the panel what they think the proper response for an immigration violation should be. We, we should apparently get rid of deportation, except for, I would imagine, one would, I, I, you know, what would say the very, very most serious criminals. But apparently, how, what sort of deterrent is there uh, without deportation, and why is that an invalid 
response to an uh, immigration it is not law it's not our responsibility as a municipality it's not responsibility as a state to enforce or to or to basically uh, try to figure out you know the, the federal government hasn't come up with a rational immigration policy we're not going to enforce you know and that's i think what the message of governor cuomo was in saying that he was going to opt out of secure communities it's now bloomberg's uh policy because he is supporting this legislation that really the intent is that we have a respons responsibility to be moral as well um but also to say that you know in implementing these policies the way they've been implemented and giving immigration agents unfettered access and just deporting thousands of people that have absolutely no prior criminal convictions who are here to provide for their families who are contributing positively to our national and to our local economies it's counterproductive for us as a city to be engaged and ensnare people in that broken immigration system you're having people distrust policing of being able to contribute positively information that it, inf information that is important for local enforcement officials to get when people feel confident that they're going to be respected that they are not going to be uh, just channeled into the immigration system and deported that's important in terms of that also has a value for us as a city we also are in very difficult economic times why are we going to start spending 75 million dollars unnecessarily to house people additionally be beyond the time that they would normally be held in Rikers Island for an, uh, someone who has absolutely no criminal conviction, to break that family apart, to take away the primary, uh, the person who's making the primary breadwinner, of really cr uh, creating an additional burden for the city. Those are all things that we have to consider. We have a responsibility um, to the individuals as well who are here, well-intentioned, and we have a responsibility to the city to be responsible with the way we spend our resources. Um, and so that's an important aspect of it, too. We have many more uh, things to think about. I think that obviously the federal government is is absolutely responsible ultimately and has neglected their responsibility and it's very unfortunate. Um, and so we are taking a stand as a, as a local municipality about what we stand for and what we value. Uh, and we value people that come here to work positively for uh, to improve our city. And and that's what the majority of immigrants do, documented or not. Okay, but and they're that's ending a value. up. In, but the people that are ending up in Rikers have been arrested. A judge has arraigned them on a probable cause standard of guilt, and they're there because they've been violating the criminal laws. So I would say, they're I would agree with you. You convicted. haven't you haven't written the law. You could say we're going to exclude victims and witnesses, but that's not how this law is written. This is a blanket exemption for people who have been arrested and are there, and and may have been, again, the case dismissed. Uh, and revolving doors throughout Rikers. There's a money saving as well in sending people to Department of to ICE uh, to be deported if they are revolving doors through uh, coming through repeatedly through Rikers. Mm -hmm. So, so make sure we just we have the facts straight, right? That there were 50 percent of the people who were transferred from Rikers to ICE last year had no criminal records whatsoever. That's D. That's D. Excuse me. No, 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 no criminal records whatsoever at the time they were transferred to ICE. That's DOC's data. It's in the legislative findings of the bill. Read it. Um, and nobody who has a criminal record benefits from the bill. Only people who have their cases dismissed or result in non-criminal violations, things like disorderly conduct, blocking the sidewalk, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but what this is, is it's, it's not a black and white situation. It's a nuanced situation where the city has multiple policy pulls, and they need to do the right thing to balance those policy pulls in the way that benefits New Yorkers. We don't have responsibility to enforce federal immigration laws. We may choose, and this bill chooses, that in certain circumstances, we're going to use our local resources to do that. But we need to balance the cost of those local resources against the harm to our community policing efforts, because people are afraid to come to the police. Um, we need to balance it against the destruction of New York families, because we're having children growing up without parents, and that has real consequences for all New Yorkers. And we need to balance it against the fiscal implications. We're talking in the range of $20 million a year that we're subsidizing the federal government's efforts here. And so if we're the ones paying and we're the ones using our resources, we have a, right. a moral duty to make wise choices about that. And that's, that's what this bill does. You, um, good. I think there's, a <clears throat> there's been some allusion here to the sort of broader context. <clears throat> um, we have 
about 12 million undocumented people in the country right now. That's an entire country, right? I mean, the Dominican Republic has 8 million people. Ireland has about 5 million. We have an entire country undocumented in the country. Um, and uh, you, you made an allusion before to Mexico. There's like a 20-year waiting list to, to be a waiting period before you can become legalized through through a if you if you're getting some sort of a visa um, avenue in, in in the Mexican case. But I think the the bigger issue here is that we have it's fundamentally um, deleterious to a democracy to have a huge cast of people who are in a permanent undocumented status, who, who have no way to become legal um, and who are therefore politically disenfranchised um, and have no, uh, no way to enjoy the, the full benefits of the society to which they're contributing. And I, I think that's very problematic as well. I think that's also a fundamental challenge and, and uh, a danger to American democracy and the rule of law. If we have people who are permanently outside the law and who are being c told all the time that they can't come in, there's no way for them to come in even though they're, they're already contributing, that I think that sends a message that some people are more equal than other people and that that's how, th that's how the society wants it. And I think that's also dangerous. But I would say that our, our, our laws make a distinction between people who come in legally and those who don't. I agree with you. There is a problem uh, with the disenfranchisement of the number of illegal aliens that we have here. But again, they took that step voluntarily uh, knowing what the consequences are. They have assumed the risk of deportation, which is clearly stated in the law. There is justice as well in maintaining a clear legal regime, which is there's nothing ambiguous about our laws. And, you know, I don't know, even though, Melissa, you sort of don't want to answer whether you think deportation is a legitimate reaction to illegal entry. In fact, the fact of the matter is, is that the, the, the sum of all of the efforts across the country against programs like Secure Communities is to delegitimate deportation. If we then send a message to the world that if you come into the country illegally, you basically face no consequences, I don't know how you maintain a immigration regime unless we're just going to say open the borders and anybody who comes in should be able to do so. And that's, that's a arguable policy position, but let's at least say that's what we're heading it's, towards. It, seem, it seems to me as a factual basis that, that the number of undocumented immigrants coming into the country has been going down. Uh, I think it's a combination of um, enforcement and the fact that our economy is in the dumper and that a lot of the, you know, there's, there's not as many jobs in this country now for people to come in for. So um, uh, are we discussing a, con a conflict between the law and reality? Is that... Uh, you know, there's another thing here, too. The way that, the, that, that you, you've been framing this as this person, an individual, made a decision to break the law or not break the law. In many cases, it's 15, 20 years ago. American law... We are a country of law and order, but we should also be a country of fairness and proportionality. And if the consequence of this guy drinking a beer is to get deported, or if the consequence of somebody being undocumented is that they end up getting separated from their family, which has all U.S. citizen children, and they're the primary breadwinner, is the harm that's caused to that family not a thing that should also be considered? If you're making a moral argument about standing up for, 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 for the rule of law and order, laws not, should not be a thing which is, is, is completely um, irrelevant of its, of its context, particularly in a policy debate such as the one that we're having here. I think those broader, um, th those broader social justice issues also need to be considered. And also, I, I agree, mean, the, I, I agree, the, Robert. The that's human element, I think, is always, you know, from, from the right wing and these more conservative think tanks, et cetera, it's a more reactionary statement. It's not black and white, as Peter Markowitz was saying. You know, the vast majority of people that come to this country and are now undocumented, okay, I don't like to use the word illegal, um, you know, is basically people that are coming here 
because they feel a sense of desperation. I tell people, just like, put it in context. Do you think that somebody would willingly just uproot themselves from the life they know, rip themselves apart from their family and from what they understand to come to a country that they have no knowledge about, they can't speak the language, and to be separated from the families just on a whim? I don't think so. I think that there's a sense of real desperation of wanting to really provide for their families, of advancing themselves. The vast majority of people that come to this country are coming to provide and are making positive contributions to our economy. And our economy is a much better place, and our country is a much better place because of those contributions. Um, and to really lose that human element and psyche about why people do what they do is just really being ignorant. Um, that's the way I see it, you know? It's really, really difficult for me to also not put in context that there may be policies that we are enacting as a country that is forcing other people to feel the need to leave their homelands. You know, those are realities that we sometimes lose sight of and that we may not want to face. But, you know, we can be reflective as a country, and in being reflective and self-critical and constructively critical, we can be a better place. And I think that, you know, what the professor mentions is very important, you know. So um, I'm very, very concerned sometimes at, at where these conversations head. But I know that in New York City, we value the contributions that our immigrants make, whether they're documented or not. And this legislation is a way of supporting that and validating it. We have the mayor's support on it. Um, we're very excited about it. And also it's been validated by the administrative changes that the Obama administration is making about the prosecutorial discretion of cases. Um, it really validates the position that now, we're taking. Now Can the I failure just respond, of the... Though? I, just yes. I, just, I just have to respond. I agree with both Melissa and Professor Smith that there is a human element on the uh, lift the deportation rule side of it. I completely agree that these are often heartbreaking cases, but I think you would also agree that when you start making exceptions to what is clearly stated law that has been <coughs> passed with full due process, that that can lead to injustice as well. And as I say, I have, I. Every legal immigrant that I've spoken to uh, believes that the justice lies in enforcement of the laws. And, in, and we have in this country the most liberal immigration regime of any country in the world. I mean, Mexico is ruthless with people who come through its borders illegally. Uh, we're one of the handful of countries globally that has birthright citizenship. So. The idea that we are not serving as a extremely welcoming spot for people that are in economic dire straits, I think is wrong. But the laws, until we change them, until we change them, they provide for deportation as a response to illegal entry. So I, I, I just don't see that it's up to New York City to claim that this is an unjust reaction and therefore we're not going to cooperate with the federal government. And 96 law, which you mentioned in your introduction, Bob, uh, said that no city or state agency can prohibit its own employees from cooperating with information sharing with federal immigration authorities. The, the city has been in violation of that law since 96 and it continues to be with this new law. This law actually has nothing to do with that provision about information sharing. It's about the use of resources to hold people, and the, and the federal law has no pro prohibition against that. But I wonder whether Heather would take the same absolutist position that laws should always be enforced to their fullest extent in every case possible in the criminal context, that every teenager who blocks a sidewalk, puts their feet up on a subway car, takes a, a piece of candy from a store, that every one of them should be locked up and held for as long as the law would allow them in every single case. Or whether you recognize that sometimes justice doesn't require the full enforcement of the law in every case, that and sometimes we actually have something called prosecutorial discretion for a reason, that justice requires looking at the individual circumstances and seeing whether the harshest penalty provided for by law is appropriate here or not. And sometimes it is, and sometimes it isn't. And what this law is saying is, when New York City feels it isn't, we're not going to get our hands dirty with taking New Yorkers who have never can been convicted of any crime, passing them to immigration so they can be shuttled to desperate detention centers in Texas and Louisiana and Alabama where they're deprived of access to counsel, 
many of them don't get to see no. an immigration judge. You know, it, We're not going to be a part of that. It, it's interesting. This is I, I like <clears throat> this. This is an important point because laws are black and white on one level, but then the enforcement of them and the interpretation of them always goes case by case, where there's much more nuance. What's interesting is that one of the responses to Obama's um, using the administrative discretion to to defer on deportations was the HALT Act, the HALT the Administration's Legalization Temptation Act, introduced by um, a representative from Texas that wanted to remove the prosecutorial discretion that would enable um, prosecutors, um, or uh, that would that would that and that law would stop the provision that allowed. Vi women who are victims of domestic <coughs> violence to go to the police and then to, there's a provision to get, you can actually get legal status if you uh, facilitate the prosecution of the abuser. They would remove prosecutorial discretion and end that practice. So, I mean, I think in many cases, because you're, you, you're, you're, you've kept coming back to justice and injustice, I think most of us, you would probably agree, it would be unjust for the woman who's getting beaten by her husband to be deported because she calls the police for help. Agree, and I agree with Peter, of course, prosecutorial discretion is important. There's no evidence that ICE is not exercising prosecutorial discretion. Only about 19 percent of those people on Rikers who are eligible for deportation are actually taken into custody by ICE. That's the information provided in Melissa's bill. So it's clear that ICE is ex exercising discretion. It's this bill which works as a blanket prohibition on cooperating in any instance uh, with a detainer that ICE has put out, saying we want to h question this person for 48 hours. I want to do a, just talk for a couple of minutes about the politics of immigration. You mentioned the bill in Texas. Um, you know, uh, Governor Perry, who's running for the Republican presidential nomination, has gotten in a lot of trouble because he seems to have done something humane along the lines of the <laughs> DREAM Act by allowing the children, the undocumented children who were raised here of undocumented parents to be accepted as Texans for the purpose of in-state tuition. And this apparently is, uh, launched him as he, as a significant attack that he is, you know, he is somehow terribly soft on immigration. President Bush, President George W. Bush, who also comes out of Texas, similarly had an understanding about about the role of Mexicans and the role even of undocumented immigrants that was, for want of a better word, softer than the kind of rhetoric you're hearing out of Arizona and the rhetoric you're now hearing out of Alabama. Because there you have examples where, as we're saying, we're not going to cooperate with ICE. In those states, they're saying, we think that the federal immigration law is broken, so we're going to be the immigration agents. So is that, I mean, th does the fact that, our, does our resistance in some way feed some argument of justification for what they're doing in a, what they're doing in Arizona and Alabama. First of all, I would like to say that I think the reaction to Perry's remarks was ridiculous. Perry said something I think what Perry that was is doing true. Was realistic. Well, I think right. I think what the issue wasn't the underlying policy. By the way, don't, it's ever, what he don't, said. don't ever let anybody know that I'm saying anything reasonably nice about Rick <laughs> Perry. So go ahead. Just for now, just for now. So we're going to edit this part out. Okay. okay. But he said if you, if you, you know, don't understand what I was doing with my state version of a DREAM Act for the children, you don't have a heart. And all the Republican nom nominees just went berserk over this. And I think that was ridiculous thin skin on their part. And he's right. Again, well, it this wasn't is thin a skin. It was playing, and it was playing a political card. I don't know that there was a rational response. I think it was playing the anti-immigrant card, which apparently is a card that works politically within some significant circles of the Republican primary electorate. It was a political judgment, I, I, because it's, it's an irrational reaction, if you'll part, you know, I mean, to the nature of the attack on him, I agree with you, was, was bizarre. Uh-huh. You well, know, I, I think part of the issue here, I think the fight that the country's having now is who's really a member of our community and who's not? Who's us and who's them? And I think part of the issue is that the who's us and who's them gets defined at different levels. We're in a federal system. There are divisions of powers between state, federal, and local governments. Um, and I think in a place like New York, um, people um, like the, um, the assemblywoman says, 
we or the council member I'm sorry that um, you know the, these people are part of our community and we want to protect them to the fullest extent that we can and include them because we think that they are making valuable contributions uh, I think in other places um, people who are in power are saying things that even though those people are picking our crops and those people are cleaning houses and those people are doing other things they're still them and we don't want them and I think it gets exacerbated through all sorts of other issues particularly you get an, an aging white electorate that doesn't want to pay for schools for younger non-white immigrant students that's a very very big lightning rod you get immigrants moving into a place right and they're older and they're getting you know they're getting all sorts of federal government benefits but when it comes to paying their taxes the incidence right the the the, the, the tax burden for schools is local so they feel it quite strongly and they say okay that's it I don't want to pay for school for those kids those are not us they're not Americans and what you end up getting is things where Hispanics all become, for example, all become suspect illegals. That all Hispanics are potentially illegals when they they're looked at, and and I, I think it's and I'm, it, it's a very very dangerous. It's thing. also coming in the context. This is one of my favorite oxymorons: is that we are a majority minority city, um, and uh, and the country is going in that direction. I mean, starting in 1980, where non-Hispanic whites for the first time were a minority in the census of this city and now the number is something on the order of 65 percent and nope. so you and the country is moving in that direction as well I think though yeah. you know because race you, is a factor you're, you're making, race okay. and ethnicity you is both a you here. both are making a point that this is sort of about race and ethnicity without rejecting that as as part of the explanation I just would say that I think what motivates a lot of people in places like Arizona is just the sense that the country is has lost control of its, border. of its borders of people who come in these are people who are not following the law in coming in and I think that that is just a feels like a profound uh, disrespect for this country so you can say it's about community Possibly, I would say that you just you shouldn't shortchange the sense that people have, which is that it is extremely important that your first act upon coming into this country, which, as I say, is the most welcoming in its immigration policy of any <coughs> country on earth, your first act should be to respect our laws. Let me and say, can I just say that in sure. terms of you know what we hear in terms of the media discourse and media coverage is all of those negative ordinances. But then you have other municipalities, unfortunately, that are reacting in the opposite direction, too, and saying, yeah, the federal government hasn't done enough, but we're not going to enforce your broken immigration system. We're not going to be complicit mm -hmm. in that broken immigration system. That's what our legislation does. On its own, Chicago has done something similar administratively. You've got Santa Clara. You've got, you know, Governor Brown in terms of what he just did in California about the State Dream Act. There's a lot of other municipalities, states, you know, that are really taking it on in a different way because it doesn't get covered doesn't mean that, that the dominant discourse is these negative reactionary ordinances that we're seeing coming out of Alabama, coming out of Arizona, et cetera. So let's, let's try to balance it, too. You know, there's a large sector of our nation that also wants to embrace, you know, and understands the positive contributions that immigrants are making and wants to do whatever it can to protect them as well. Yeah, very quickly, Peter, you wanted to Yeah, say I was just going to say, the, the really disappointing thing to me is that if we things have, have become the Wild West in immigration on, on the local level and what's going on in Alabama and Arizona is, is quite scary and it, mm -hmm. and it is about racial politics and some politicians um, playing on people's worst angels for their own political benefit but what's really disappointing to me is that the Obama administration ha has failed to see the long view of the changing demographics of this country and of what the American people want. He's played the exact same playbook that the Bush administration played. He thought that he could pass comprehensive immigration reform by being as harsh as possible mm -hmm. on enforcement. And I, and I would ask um, the hundreds of thousands of people who sit in immigration detention in this country whether they view our country's laws as the most lenient in, in the world. Um, but what's going to happen is the same thing that happened to the Bush administration. The enforcement ramps up, they deliver nothing on comprehensive immigration reform, and the Democrats are losing the Latino vote. Yeah. Good. But if you say so that let me just, if 100,000 makes this a not a, an, 
We have 100,000 in detention. We have 20 million people who are here illegally. If 100,000 experiencing the consequences of their acts, of hundreds of thousands yeah. is too much. I mean, you are <clears> then <throat> suggesting that there should be no uh, detention and deportation of people in the country illegally. What, why, why should we have anybody in, in detention? What would be no. the proper number can of we, can people pull us back yes, who are in detention? Steps here. Yeah. I agree very vigorously with you, Heather, that I think there's a profound sense that the border's out of control among a certain segment of people. I don't agree with that, but I do think that they feel like that the people coming are disrespecting American laws. There's two responses I would give, um, perhaps three, but we're running out of time, and I promised I'd only give a, a short response here. One of them is um, you could look at it as someone disrespecting our laws. You could also say somebody thinks so highly of our country that they're willing to risk their lives to get here to try to work for their families. I mean, that's a pretty big endorsement of America. The other response, and I'll do this very quickly, is there's the potential either for us to not pay for the schooling for these kids, right, who are then uh, going to constitute bigger and bigger parts of our labor force, um, or we could forge a new intergenerational contract, a social contract between older Americans and younger Americans and immigrants, invest in those schools, invest in those kids, and in fact grow. And give them a path to legalization. Yes. Give them yes. a path to yes. legalization. Yes, sir. Tell us your name and the campus you're from. My name is Ali Afani. I'm from Brooklyn College, uh, graduate uh, political science program. My question really has to do with the jurisdiction of the, the whole immigration debate. It is strictly, you know, a federal, you know, jurisdiction. And the argument that some of the governors are making for taking this, you know, drastic step is that the federal government is really not doing its job. Where does it state in the Constitution that even if we go by that argument, if the federal government is derelict in its duty to overhaul the immigration policy, where does it state in the Constitution that, that the state can, can step in and, and do the federal job? This is a very, I mean, can, the, can a, you know, even more broadly, can the state nullify a federal law that they don't agree with? Right, I mean, that's I'll a different issue. I <laughs> huh? yeah. I'll leave it up to the lawyer yeah. to, right, to, right. to debate I mean, that one. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't think it should be Look this way. A controversial for localities to participate in enforcing federal law. The, the supremacy clause of the Constitution says that federal law is supreme and presumes cooperation with that law. It does, it, you cannot try to preempt uh, federal law by conflicting local and state statutes. So I, I don't think it requires an explicit grant of power to say that uh, states and localities shall cooperate with federal immigration. Kind of the flip side of the Tenth Amendment argument. But <laughs> right, right. Although there's there the preemption laws. What, what this is um, termed is there's a field. There are certain fields that are exclusively federal, where the federal government can operate and no one else can operate. Things that are uniquely federal, and there's nothing more classically uniquely federal since the late 1800s than um, immigration enforcement. And so when Arizona decides they don't like the way the United States government is doing it, we're going to do it different, Alabama's going to do it different, then we have 50 different immigration laws, and that's something that our But now here's a case state. in which New York says we're going to do it different as well. And nope, but that's actually entirely different, because that is the 10th Amendment. What the, there is also a provision of the Constitution that says the federal government can't force states to do its job. The federal government can't say, we have this federal regulatory system. Now, New York, you pay for it. You do it. Your officers go out and That is also their under the Constitution. Both the principle that you, you promoted and the one that you're proposing here are both parts of the Constitution, that there are the state, the federal government only has the powers expressly enumerated to it, uh, and the others are reserved to the states or the people. Now, there's been, you know, negotiations. This is an ideological flipping on its head of the, ten, of the Tenth Amendment argument. But, but, but immigration <laughs> power can't simultaneously be exclusively federal and then this and then but you're also saying that the states should be able to have their own immigration regime no that, that's, that's, the that's, states that's not what he's saying that's not what i'm saying at all i'm saying it's exclusively federal and the the, the federal government can amendment. ask and welcome in the states and the states and the localities then have a choice of whether to to spend their own resources in other words, the federal government can enforce federal law within the <clears> states but of can't 
force the states of course. to carry out that law. Of course. It, it, constitutionally, they cannot compel the state right. to do something, to use yeah. its police power in a particular way, I think France. is what you're yeah. saying. Yes, ma'am. Tell us your name and your campus, please. Hi, my name is Najla Tete. I go to John Jay College, and my question is, will actually be addressed to the whole panel. Um, would you please elaborate on the politics of immigration and security in the United States? Does, a, does the Obama administration stand to lose or gain from its current policies on these matters? And why is the Obama touting about the increase in deportations now? You're the politician, or at least the only do you overt want, do you politician. Want to punt this one. Oh no! <laughs> I, I mean, I think he's. I, I. I really think that, and not just the Latino community, right? I mean, the immigration debate is framed as it's like a Latino-only issue, but really, it, it's, it's, it's not. We know it's much broader than that. But I think he's. Uh, oh, it's an Irish issue. It's an Asian right, issue. Of it course. It is. Of course. He's losing. Um, I think he's losing a lot of credibility on this issue, unfortunately. Um, and regardless, you know. Even if some of us more liberal are going to say that he is not done enough, he's never going to convince, you know, the conservatives and people that may be more hardline on this issue to vote his way, right? So that, that he's not going to—I really don't understand, to some extent, uh, the politics in this case, because he's not going to convince— the more conservative elements of, uh, you know, of the Republican Party to vote for him, even if he's more hardline, deporting more people. And we have seen record number of deportations under this administration as opposed to the In prior In part because of the secure communities right. policy. Right. So it's, it's, a really, it's a really interesting one. And, I mean, that's as far as I'll take it. So I think Obama's entire presidency has been pitched toward the independent voters who might vote one way, who might have who might have voted for McCain if Sarah Palin wasn't on the ticket, right? And who might vote Republican this time. I think he's pitched there. And I think it has, I mean, I think the financial crisis has sort of, has really hamstrung and distracted him. But I think that he, 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 he has worried so much about that. He's now panicked. Oh my God, I haven't done anything for the Latino community in three years. I really need to hurry up. And we, only have, we only have 10 minutes left. I want to get a few more questions in, please. Hello, my name is Tabitha Edwards and I go to Brooklyn College. My question is open to the panel. It's um, basically, will Americans do the jobs that immigrants now do? <laughs> right, I mean, Excellent you, question. <laughs> you. Well, there's many cities where they are. Uh, you know, in, in Washington, D.C., Americans are driving cabs. That's true in Cincinnati. Uh, that's the sort of displacement. It's a tremendous number of, of African workforce. immigrants driving cabs in Washington D.C. If you, if, I mean, I, they, they may be legal. There's also a number of I'm African not Americans not legal, driving cabs. But there's a tremendous number of African well, immigrants, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, but the, if you listen to the farmers in Alabama, you'll hear a different story, right? The farmers in Alabama it. right now are running scared because they can't find anybody who will work their fields, and they are refusing to plant seed. The farm equipment. Orders are down, but in, and, and it's but an in, of things to come. But in fact, I'm going to interrupt the race just, just, to that, wages? just that we're running short of time. Immigration has always been one of those issues that's cut across ideological lines. For, for many, many years, organized labor was kind of an anti-immigrant force because they saw them as competition. And you had big business saying, we need the cheap labor of, of immigration. So you do have this kind of, it's, you know, it's, there's not a clear ideological divide on the issue. The issue was kind of mushed up a lot of the traditional... Absolutely. P uh, political lines. Yes, sir. Uh, Christopher Drake, Queens College. Um, it appears to me that this bill uh, is a corrective measure to a federal law that um, can be arguably ineffective or violative, personally. Uh, and that it doesn't really repeal it or block it, but just refines it. Uh, do you think that this is a, a proper way to really go about reforming political uh, immigration policy, excuse me, in New York City and to the New York City citizens uh, and to the, 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 you know, the people that are undocumented. Well, let me just quickly say, and then, and then I'll ask Peter as well, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's necessarily reforming it. It's fine-tuning it, right? We're really talking about how to most effectively use our city resources. Um, and, and again, the, the way the federal immigration policies are, it's, um, it's just, you know, grabbing a whole bunch of people that were not really originally the intent of these policies to begin with. You know, it's a criminal alien program. It really is to go after people that are posing a risk to safety and security. Obviously, none of, un, uh, none of us, I don't want people that are posing a risk to safety and security in our communities as well. So we kind of eliminate it. So it's just fine tuning and really trying to really, uh, what the original intent we believe is 
uh, and, and really being more effective with the use of our resources. And again, also aff affirming the positive contributions that the majority of immigrants are making to our local economy. The mayor has spoken about it, our speaker has spoken about it, uh, many others have spoken about it, and, and that's the way that we've approached this bill. So I don't know, Peter, since you... I think you did it perfectly. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Michelle Michelle from John Jay College. The panel pointed out that Governor Brown in California recently signed a legislation provided um, college benefits to undocumented students. Do you think that the DREAM Act will become the variation law in, in New York State before it becomes the law in the United States? What is the, what is the status of... Uh it's still of, pending. Uh, of un I mean, if, if, if you're an undocumented immigrant who graduates from a New York City high school, are you considered a New Yorker for purposes of college Depending tuition? Depending on how many years you've gone, um, you, you, but many, yes, are considered to be, um, they, they will get in-state tuition if they graduate from a New York City high school. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to, the, this, the, this question actually drags the last one in as well. Um, I talked before about various communities, right? Local communities, state communities, the federal, national community. Um, this is a way that New York State could say, we don't look at all of these children as lawbreakers and aliens. Uh, we don't see them as them, we see them as us. And it's a way that the New York State Dream Act would not change their federal immigration status, they could not work legally, but what it would do would be to open up and facilitate the educational aspirations of so many of, the, of, of these children, of, of, of our children in New York State who have grown up here and who have um, you know, who've gone through the New York City or the New York State public schools. It would be a continuation, uh, an extension of the law that Governor Pataki signed into law to, in 2002, giving them in-state tuition benefits. Um, and it would also extend the logic of Plyler v. Doe which is uh, the 1982 case in the su Supreme Court. Justice Brennan wrote that um, because they're, they're brought here as children, these children should get protection and should be allowed public education through 12th grade. And I think that then this would be a way of extending that. It would be another way of including these children in, in, in our community who have been raised here and grown up here. Yes. Hi, my name is Carla Montalvo and I'm from Queens College. And my question is kind of like a follow up. Um, Obama tried to slip in the DREAM Act to be passed before he lost the House, you know, uh, 2011. Do you think if he were to be reelected, he would attempt to do the same thing again before his next four years are up? Well, I mean, I, th I think, you know, <clears throat> as a Latina, as someone who was very much um, inspired by the hope, right, that, that we would get some serious immigration reform and it was promised to us, you know, that, that would be handled within the first year. You know, we lost an incredible opportunity, uh, leaving it to the last minute, you know, we, we uh, uh, and in terms of the shift and the change that happened in Congress. A lot of this work needed to have been started earlier and really, you know, lay the foundation for that to pass. Unfortunately, if the Congress doesn't switch again, we're gonna have a problem, you know? It's really gonna make it much more difficult for any sort of national legislation to pass. And so uh, we lost an opportunity. That's why many of us on this particular issue have been disappointed and we're hoping that there'll be some changes. And, and the, the Obama administration, I think, has to be held accountable for the way they bungled that in the first year. But we also have to recognize that it's really the Republicans in Congress mm -hmm. that have blocked comprehensive mm -hmm. immigration reform. The place where I would hold the Obama administration's feet to the fire is going forward no holds bar on an enforcement only strategy when actually there are a lot of administrative things that could be mm -hmm. done to achieve what Congress refuses to do. The, 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 the rhetoric, I'm sorry, go ahead. Thing, yes. One thing is, I mean, what's interesting about that is we had 55 votes in the Senate. The House already passed, passed it. Yeah. So, in fact, without the need for a supermajority by a super polarized um, political climate, that the DREAM Act would have passed. The second thing is that it really makes me long for the days of Ronald Reagan, um, with, <laughs> which is a sort of funny feeling for me, but it really does because he, t he, he was able to look at these, um, at the issue of immigration in a way that took the stories that we've been telling into account as well as the need to enforce laws and deter and things like that. But isn't that in some ways the case both with President Bush and with Governor Perry in that seeing uh, immigration in a uh, 
you know, in a in a way where they live with the issue of yeah, immigration I, I, as opposed I, to I, other I, yes. as opposed to other states in a way that nobody else does. You know, we only have about uh, two and a half minutes left. Um, the rhetoric on immigration throughout much of the uh, much of the 1990s was about legalization. How do you find a path? There was a struggle to find a path towards legalization. You don't hear that now. The debate now is is much more heavily you know is, is a much more has a much more emphasis in the area of enforcement, protecting the border, deporting people, keeping people out. A, why is that? And B, do you see any chance of that turning around? And any uh, do you uh, do you do you expect the tenor of that debate to shift more in a direction of legalization? Um, well. First of all, enforcement is still a minute fraction of the people that are in this country illegally. Uh, and I would say, as you mentioned, labor union Cesar Chavez used to, was a explicit opponent of illegal immigration because he saw that it drove wages down. And, and he believed, you know, you come into the country legally and you compete uh, with, on, on equal footing with people that are in the in the legal in the market legally, so I think that that's going to be a continued with the economic problems that we're facing. I think there's going to be continued concern about the fact that we don't have control over the borders. We have less than a minute to go. I'm going to give you the last word here. I mean, do you see that debate? I mean, you've been dealing, you've been living with this debate, certainly in East Harlem, right. for all the time you've been in office, and, and you and you come out of a labor union. I mean. Um, do you see that turning around at all? And it's very, very brief. Well, I, I hope so. But I think, unfortunately, when we talk about any sort of pathway to citizenship, automatically people start saying it's an amnesty program, and then that seems to scare people away. That's the problem. I think that there's a sensible way of doing this, and I'm hoping that there will be moral courage at a national level in order to get it done, because we cannot continue to live and have an immigration system that continues to basically rip so many families apart and that really, really is not validating the positive contributions that immigrants are making to our nation. This, uh, we've been discussing essentially what some people feel is a conflict between the law and justice. And we don't have the answers here, but I think this was a good discussion. I thank you all, and we'll see you next time on CUNY Forum. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.